Father, we just ask your blessing in your hand, and Father, I ask, ask Lord, Lord, for your anointing, and Lord, Spirit, have your way in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen. Amen. The year is 1923. A boy is born in Cologne, Germany. That year, Hitler makes his first attempt to take over the government. The boy is Jewish. Before his 10th birthday, Hitler takes over Germany with the aim of destroying the Jewish people under his dominion and their children. The boy watches as the Jewish people are progressively degraded, barred from public life, dehumanized, vilified, demonized. One day he's told, stay home today, stay home. It is Kristallnacht, the night of broken glasses. Jewish stores and buildings and synagogues are burned to the ground. Jewish people are brutalized, taken to concentration camps. His father knows he's got to get his son out. At the same time, Christians and others in the, in the United Kingdom approach the British government and implore them, we have to save the Jewish children from Germany. In the spring of 1939, he, he, his parents walk him to the train station in Cologne, Germany. His father tells him, say goodbye to your mother. You may never see her again. He never would. He boards the train out of Nazi Germany to the ocean where a ship carries him to England. Then Hitler invades Poland and the Second World War begins. The British government arrests all Germans in the land, Jews, Nazis, and others. He is put on a ship with other Germans and Nazis. He lands in Canada where he's imprisoned in a prisoner of war camp. Many of his friends never make it out of Germany. Many of his relatives he never sees again. He ends up in America where he meets a woman whose family also escaped death at the hands of the Tsar. He marries her, and the boy at the train station becomes my father. We are part of a mystery, a 4,000-year-old mystery, a drama, an odyssey that continues to our day. It was last autumn I was planning to write the sequel to The Return of the Gods when God interrupted me. I was in my car bringing my three sons to school and I saw the image of a dragon, a red dragon. It was the beginning of the Lord leading me which would become the next book, The Dragon's Prophecy. I had no idea then, but when I started writing the book at the beginning of 2024, the Chinese New Year came and it turned out 2024 is the year of the dragon. It is still the year of the dragon. Just weeks before this conference, dragons began appearing all over New York City. Images, representations of dragons on the New York Stock Exchange, Rockefeller Center, a gigantic dragon on top of the Empire State Building. It's part of a promotion campaign, but nevertheless, dragons in New York City. There is, a, it turns out there's a comet, comes by the Earth only once every 71 years. The name is the Mother of Dragons Comet. It's also called the Devil's Comet. And the year of its approach is 2024, the year of the dragon. All this in the year that the Lord led me about to write about the dragon. The dragon I saw in the car was the dragon of Revelation 12. At the start of 2024, I, was asked, I spoke at the rabbi's conference in Florida, and I was led to speak of what I was getting from the Lord. It was just coming, the dragon of Revelation 12. But I thought that's kind of out of the box to close the rabbi's conference with a scripture from the book of Revelation and the dragon of Revelation. I get there. I look at the screen. It has a theme of the conference, one scripture, it's from Revelation. It's from Revelation 12, the chapter of the dragon. And the word was a word of encouragement, but the vision was of the dragon. At the beginning of that vision, or near the beginning, are these words. It says, another sign appeared in the heavens. Behold, a great red dragon having seven horns and seven heads and ten horns, and on the horns were seven crowns. The dragon, he was in ages past an angelic being turned away from God, turned against God. He became inverted, the one who inverts the works of God. In Hebrew, he's called Satan, the opposer, the opponent, the enemy. Translated into Greek, the word became the accuser, diabolos, from which we get the word devil. And he said, I will ascend to the throne of the Most High. He exists to oppose the will of God, the works of God, the plans of God, the purpose of God. That is one side of the vision, but then there's another. It says, a great sign appeared in the heavens, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. 
A woman with a sun and moon and 12 stars, that's the symbol given in Genesis of Israel. The woman gives birth to the Messiah. The woman is Israel, the Jewish people. They are the ones placed on the earth by the hand of God as vessels on the earth to bring forth, give birth to his purposes, accomplish his will, bring his life into the world, and to be witnesses on earth that God exists. So on one hand, you have a people put on the earth as the vessel of God's purposes. On the other hand, the, an entity that exists to destroy the purposes of God. So what happens if the two dwell on earth? What will happen is an explosion, a rage of fury, a war of the one against the other. The dragon will seek to destroy the woman. The enemy will seek to destroy the Jewish people to wipe Israel out of existence. He would become obsessed with them. He would rage against them. As the accuser, he would accuse the children of Israel. As the father of lies, he would cast lies against them. And as the murderer, the destroyer, he would seek to do everything in his power to destroy them. Because if he can destroy the Jewish people, he can destroy the witness and purpose of God. That is why the Jewish people, the children of Israel, have become the most opposed, slandered, hated, victimized, villainized, persecuted, attacked, warred against people on earth in the history of this planet. It is a hatred that is beyond rational, beyond natural. In the communist world, the Jews were hated for being capitalist. In the capitalist world, they were hated for being communist. The status quo hated them for representing revolution. The revolutionary hated them for representing the status quo. The colonial empires hated them for being anti-colonial, and the woke hates them for being colonial. They were hated for keeping to themselves. They were hated for not keeping to themselves. They were hated in the pagan world, the secular world, the Middle Ages, the modern world, in every land, at every time, at every age. What kind of world is it that the nations of that world gather together to condemn not the nations that have killed millions of their people, but a tiny little democracy the size of New Jersey. That is not normal. That is not natural. It is supernatural. See, the first anti-Semite was not a medieval leader or an ancient king. The first anti-Semite was an angel. That's why anti-Semitism never goes away. It's not natural. It's an angelic phenomenon. Anti-Semitism is the ism of a fallen and twisted angel. It was said when Fred Frederick the Great asked for proof of God's existence, his minister is said to have told him the answer in two words, the Jews. And so as the existence of the Jews bears witness to the existence of God, so the war against their existence bears witness to the existence of the enemy, the devil. Every Jewish life is part of the war. The dragon, it says, stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. The dragon hates the woman, Israel, for bringing Messiah into the world. Because Israel was created to bring his life and his kingdom into the world. And it's written, the dragon was enraged with the woman and pursued her. The Greek word means hunted down and even means persecuted. It's no accident that the most evil people of this world happen to be obsessed with the Jewish people. From Stalin to Hitler, from bin Laden to Hamas, they're only players, they're only vessels of the dragon. It is the longest war in human history, and we're in the middle of it. This past year, since we last met, the ancient war erupted to produce the deadliest day in Jewish history since the Holocaust and the most widespread global outbreak of anti-Israel, anti-Jewish rage in modern history. It was a Friday night at Beth Israel, the congregation I lead in New Jersey. I was led to share a mystery from a book I had written. The mystery ordained according would point it to that there would be an attack on Israel, an invasion. It would catch the nation by surprise. It would happen in the year 2023. It would happen in the month of October, that the day on which it would happen would be a Sabbath. The invaders would come on a Hebrew holy day. 
one of the sacred Moedim of Leviticus, the invasion would come upon the land of Israel on the first Saturday of October, 2023. The night I shared that mystery was October 6th. Before the stroke of midnight that night in America, the mystery would unfold and begin across the world on the shores of Israel. And those who were at the service awoke that Saturday morning to hear the news. They would send messages to the ministry saying, this is what you spoke about. The mystery involved an ancient Hebrew ordinance, a countdown from the start of the Six-Day War of over 18,000 days to the exact day of October 7th. Now, there are so many mysteries of what happened and what's happening and what is going to happen. And the actual moving of end-time prophecy, which we have seen this year, and I'll be opening that up in the book, but the key tonight is what we have just witnessed since the last time we gathered together is the very real manifestation of the ancient war of the dragon and the woman, the enemy, and Israel. What happened on October 7th was not political, it was demonic. It was the fury of the dragon. His fingerprints were all over it. In Revelation 12, the dragon launches his attack in the form of what in Greek is called the pot potemon. It means a deluge, a flood. It says he spewed forth a flood from his mouth to wipe away, flood away the woman Israel. Hamas gave a code name to the invasion of October 7th. It was called Operation Tufan. Do you know what Tufan is in Arabic? It's the word flood. It was called Operation Flood, as a flood from the dragon's mouth. Later in Revelation, out of the dragon's mouth come unclean spirits as frogs. They go forth to the world, cause the nations to come against Israel at Armageddon, a fury of destruction. And so it was no accident that after October 7th, a spirit went forth through the world, igniting a frenzy of anti-Israel, anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic hatred. You think that people would be sympathetic, but they rejoiced in Jewish blood, even in America. On the campuses that represent America's future among the young of America. Do you know that on, on the young of America, it's a near majority who actually are pro-Hamas? They believe what Hamas did on October 7th was justified. Behold the future. Even the chant. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, has the enemy's fingerprints all over. It's a chant of destruction. You see, when God gave Israel the promise of the land, the words he uses again and again is from the sea to the river. So the enemy now twists it, reverses it, and it becomes from the river to the sea. We witnessed this past year the same spirit, the spirits that are part of what will be Armageddon. Now I want to take you into another realm, a personal realm. The day I started writing about the dragon, when it, strange things began to happen. Too many to say here, but I'll mention just this. As I'm writing the book, and specifically the part of Revelation where the dragon spews that flood to wipe away Israel, a flood comes to Beth Israel. In the vision of the flood, its actual flood comes up, cuts off the streets, cuts off the ministry, and we are an island. It cuts us off. Now, now, that was just before. Now, finally, days later, it goes down just in time for us to have a Friday service. We have the service. The next day, the flood comes back. It's a second flood. It's a different flood. But it looks exactly the same. And it cuts off our building. It blocks the road. We become an island again. And the thing is, the first flood came because of a storm, a rainstorm. But the second flood, there was no rain, and there was no water, and there was no, there was no anything. There was no storm. It turns out there was a strange freak accident that day. A water main opens up just on our street, creates the exact same flood that we just had, cuts off the building and we're pretty much a dead end, cuts us off. And then right after that, a third flood comes. And it's all happening while I'm writing about the flood of the dragon against Israel. So I'm trying to hurry up. It was only after I stopped writing about the dragon and the floods that the flood stopped. I was going to write a chapter about earthquakes, but I said, nah, let's not, I'll, I'll skip that. Let me skip that. The book comes out in two months and said, please pray for me and my family and our ministry and the book and everything. But you know what? This message is part of it because when I started writing this message, I, I write it while I'm at the conference. In the middle of writing it, 
my computer locks down and refuses, me, refuses to, I can work on this file. It had never happened like this. It took four IT people hours here to undo it to get this message out. And they still can't figure out what happened. The enemy doesn't, and you know what, I also, I've never had a migraine before I speak, but I had a migraine, I was out today, totally. The enemy doesn't want you to hear the message. Further on, I'm gonna tell you the exact moment that the computer shut down, because I believe that's what he doesn't want you to hear. Uh, for your life and for this movement. The world deals with imaginary dragons, we deal with a real one. As real as the pogroms of Russia, as real as the Nazis of the Third Reich, so real, that if it had prevailed, I would not be standing here today. If Hitler had his way, I wouldn't be here. If the dragon had his way, I wouldn't be here, and many of you wouldn't be here today. What we have seen this year is how real this is. You see, it never, it, it's never gone for, for long, because the dragon is a light sleeper. It has everything to do with every one of you, because every one of you in this auditorium, every one of you online, the dragon has declared war against you. First, if you bear the image of God, the dragon has declared war on you. If you are born on top of that, of the seed of Israel, the dragon has all the more declared war on you. If you're born again, you're also a child of Israel in the spirit, the dragon has also all the more declared war on you. As it is written, the dragon warred against the rest of her, Israel's children, who hold the testimony of Yeshua, the Messiah. There is a war. The dragon has been waging it against your life since your life began. He's been warring to keep you from the purpose that God created you for. A war to keep you from hope, from peace, from joy, from fullness, from God, from his spirit, from his love, from his power, from your calling. And he wounds. Some of you have been wounded and hurt and scarred. Behind it all, it wasn't people, it was the dragon. Some of you have, he's tried to bind and addict and enslave. Some he's tried to hinder, intimidate, make you live in fear. Some of you he's tried to cripple with shame and guilt and your past. And some he's tried to entice and tempt and draw away and defile and degrade. He has waged war against you. If you look back at your life, you can see how he's waged war. And here we in this building, in this movement, we have to awaken to the realization that because we, this movement represents both Israel and those of Messiah, we constitute a double threat to the enemy. He's all the more going to come against us. You can be sure that he's war been warring against this movement, against us, our ministries, our congregations. We have no idea how much he seeks to stop us from fulfilling our calling and touching this world because we represent the end of his kingdom. Because when Israel comes to Messiah, that's the end of his reign. And if the Jewish people are coming back to Israel, and if we're coming back to Messiah, I mean somebody else is coming back to this world. So of course he's going to attack us. Of course. For 2,000 years he did everything in his power to keep the Jewish people from coming back to the land of their calling. But they're back. For 2,000 years he's done everything to keep us from our Messiah, but we're back. And the return of Israel to the land and our return, it's joined together. There's a crucial secret from this that we are to learn. And I'll, I'm going to say it this way. When I was eight years old, the teacher, we had two classes together, the teacher told both classes, because she saw me talking, she said, you're all going to stay late after school because of Jonathan Kahn. <laughs> when I got home from the bus, I got off the bus, there were three kids waiting for me. From that class, they come up to me, they said, because of what you did, we're going to beat you up. Now, I can't say it was anti-Semitism because two of them were Jewish. One was Gentile, so it was Jew and Gentile, one in trying to beat up Jonathan Gaunt. I had to figure out what to do. So I said, you know, I'd love to fight the three of you. However, I happen to be wearing my good shoes. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go in my house, take off those shoes, put on some sneakers, come right out, fight the three of you, you better be here. They said, that sounds like a good idea. So I went home, took off my shoes, opened a bag of potato chips, turned on the television, watched cartoons, looked out the window, they were still there for like an hour. Until finally they realized they had been had. That, my brothers and sisters, is a Jewish fight story. Jackie Mason once said, Italians have fight stories, the Irish have fight stories, Jews have almost fight stories. 
I almost got into a fight. I was ready. I was at the edge. If they said one more word, one more word, that would have been it. The problem is nobody knows what the word is. For 2,000 years, the Jewish people wandered the earth with no army, no protection, at the mercy of others, and mostly did not fight, and the dragon had a field day. And it was right here at this point that my computer went down. So listen to what I'm about to say. The enemy doesn't want you to know this. When the Jewish people rose out of the ashes of the Holocaust, when they entered the land, they were surrounded on every side by enemies bent on their destruction. They realized something. If they did not learn to fight, they would not survive. After 2,000 years, they had to become fighters, warriors. I don't believe it's an accident for this. The first time you saw images of these fighters tonight. They had to be, they were pioneers, they were farmers, but they had to become soldiers, warriors. It was because of God that Israel was resurrected from the dead. But it was also because of the enemy and his hatred that the Jew became the Israeli, the fighters they would become. They would no longer be victims of the dragon. They would now become fighters of the dragon. And so those unlikely survivors of persecution of the Holocaust, they put on army fatigues and learned how to use arms. An amazing thing, the people who didn't know how to fight became among the most feared and revered fighting forces on planet Earth. It's no accident. It was all foretold in the prophets. When Israel was raised from the dead, when, it says in Ezekiel, when he saw the dry bones, he said they became an exceedingly great army. And it's written in that day, none would make them afraid. And here's the thing. What Israel is in the physical realm in this world, we are in the realm of the spiritual. So here's the secret. Those who are of Messiah are not just spiritual Israelites. They are spiritual Israelis. We have to become fighters as Israel is of the fighters in the world. We have to become fighters in the spirit in God. They became warriors on earth. It's time for us to become warriors in the spirit. They became among the strongest fighting forces in the world. It's time for us to become among the strongest forces in the spirit. Why did the Israelis become so powerful in fighting? Because God's hand was on them. The same hand that kept them alive for 2,000 years against the enemy's onslaught. It was only because of that hand that that German boy was saved from death. And I'm standing here because of that hand. Only we are alive today and this movement is alive today. The Lord gave a powerful anointing to the Israelis to fight evil, to fight for that same reason, the Lord has given us a powerful anointing to fight if we will use it. An anointing to become mighty and victorious if you fight. Yes, the enemy wars against you, but the Lord is with you. And far mightier. You are no longer to live as a victim of the dragon. You are now to live as a fighter of the dragon. If you fight, God will give you the power to stand against all darkness, all sin, all obstacles of this present age to resist. In that same vision, Revelation 12 says of the dragon, of the people of God, says they overcame him. You have been given the power especially to overcome him. Use it. Think how much time and energy and devotion and thought the IDF the Israeli Defense Force gives to the cause of fighting all these evils. Think how serious. Imagine what would happen if we were, we took a fraction of that and we were serious to that degree to fight the darkness, fight the sin, fight the, the evil of our age. If we actually did that, what would happen? Israel has become excellent in fighting. We are to become excellent in fighting the enemy. The dragon has attacked you. But you don't have to take it. You don't have to accept it. You don't have to accept the hindrance. You don't have to accept that sin. You don't have to accept that fear or bondage or a spirit of defeat. You have been given the power to fight and overcome and actually become victorious. It's time to tell the enemy no more. In the name of Messiah, you shall not prevail. We are the return of the first messianic believers, disciples, messengers, Jew and Gentile of the book of Acts. This is the return. And they were fighters and they were mighty. 
They weren't afraid of the world, those first but believers and disciples, apostles. They weren't afraid of the world. The world was afraid of them. They weren't running from the enemy. The enemy was running from them. And they changed the world. So in view of the days to come, the last days, it is time to become an exceedingly great army. The days ahead are going to require those who fight and those who go against the flow and those who stand against the darkness. The age is waiting for us to become the mighty warriors of God we were called to be. And each, you, each of you to become a mighty warrior of God. God did not call you to be defeated. He called you to become victorious. And as the people of Israel became the IDF, it's time that we, Messianic believers, become a spiritual IDF. It just hit me as I was writing this. The Lord just hit me now at Messiah. The Lord used that train in Cologne, Germany to save my father's life. I was only born, I'm only alive because of that train. Years, so years later, the enemy tried to end my life by using a train that smashed into my car. Yet God used the train to again save my life that I could become born again. And on that mountaintop, I'm not going into it tonight, but on that mountaintop where I gave my life to the Lord, I saw these strange words written in the rocks. It read, no Jew shall enter these sacred grounds. It was the enemy. You see, the very fact that we came to Messiah is to the enemy an act of war. There's, so there's only one way to live in victory, and that is to fight. You're in a war. There is no demilitarized zone in this war. If you don't fight, you don't win. But if you do fight, if you will fight, you are guaranteed victory. Don't fear the fight. Embrace it. Because by it, you will become victorious. And when all hell comes against you, don't you fear, don't you panic, don't you get down. Rejoice and be glad because it means you're doing something right. The enemy knows what God is planning to do in your life. If the attack is great, then greater is the blessing God has for you and this movement when you prevail. Here we are in 2024, a time of war. And Israel and the Jewish people are again under attack. But you know what? The pharaohs tried to wipe us out. The Assyrians tried to destroy us. Babylon tried to obliterate us. Rome tried to erase us from the world. Hitler tried to annihilate us. The Soviet Union sought our destruction. And the terrorists of this world are bent on wiping us off the face of the earth. But, 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 the pharaohs are gone. Assyria lies in the dust. Babylon is fallen. Rome has crumbled. Hitler has perished. The Soviet Union has collapsed. And the terrorists, Hezbollah, Al-Qaeda, Hamas, they will perish from the earth. But, 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 the nation of Israel lives. Am Yisrael Chai. Am Yisrael Chai. The nation of Israel lives because the God of Israel lives. Messiah lives. And the people of God will live. And you will live. And you will prevail. We're here. We're still standing. The enemy will don't be, fight to good fight, never give up, never give in, never give ground, never give up, fight the evil, fight the sin, fight it, you shall overcome, you shall prevail, for greater is the God of Israel in you than the dragon in the world, warriors of God, fight your good fight and overcome the dragon by the blood of the Lamb, by the power of the Almighty. He's not going to stop me. He's not going to stop me. And by the name, above every name, that is name, Yeshua HaMashiach, our great Messiah, the mighty one of Israel, and the slayer of the dragon. Amen. God bless you.